South Bank show, Lenny Henry explores the world of black American comedy. <laughs> His journey surveys a comic and social history from the days of slavery, segregation and minstrel shows through to the civil rights era and into a diverse and exuberant present. Denmark's film is a celebration of this resilient comic tradition, but the film's also a personal and affecting journey for Lenny Henry, who takes the opportunity to revisit his own comic history and put it into context. So what's the show about, man? Well, it's about um, African-American humor, you know, where it's from, where it's at, where it's going, and uh, how it ties in with the African-American experience, you know. Now, let me take a wild guess. Do you have in mind an hour of boring-ass interviews with a whole bunch of the same people talking about the same old shit I've seen before? Well, you know, I mean, we, we want to do something a bit different. I mean. I've done some research, you know. Research? Research? Man, I can't let you do this to yourself. Look, the first thing you gotta understand is this is a diverse community, man. I have done this before, you know. Man, it ain't even about that, man. You know what I'm saying? Look, y'all have gotta be humble. You know what I'm saying? Because this is a lot bigger than you are, baby. Look, I like your ass. I'm gonna fix you up. Let's give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. And your name is? Eugene Carmichael III. All right, Eugene Carmichael III. What do you do for a living? Commodities broker. Commodities broker. Let me ask you, have you ever been hypnotized? No, I haven't, and frankly, I'm quite skeptical. A one, two, three, trance. <laughs> now at my command, you will cluck like a chicken. One, two, three. You're never going to be... But God! <laughs> Beg your pardon? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the skeptic. And I assure you, he will remain this way as long as I... But God! As long as I... Oh, my God! <laughs> He's not breathing. Call an ambulance, quick! Yo, Keenan, uh, this was deep, brother. You see, you was talking about the comedy explosion, like in 1990 with the young black comics. And, and uh, you said something happened and something else was going to happen, but you didn't say why or what. Could you not expound upon what you were saying, brother man, because you deep? <laughs> okay. And what happened was black comedy became hot. You know, and Living Color was successful, that Def Jam came and that was successful. Mm -hmm. The problem was that there's, there was only a handful of people, you know, talent at that particular time. Who could deliver. Right. But, they, but you had this massive demand. It's like when rap exploded. There was a huge glut, you know, of, of, of rappers and everybody was a rapper. Mm -hmm. And out of that, there came some really good people who are still left. But for the most part, it has scaled itself down. And the same thing is going to happen with comedy. And the third thing is for you white people. You will never, ever see Elvis Presley the fat ass again, all right? <laughs> the man is dead. You don't never hear black people talking about, guess what? You ain't going to believe this. I saw Marvin Gaye at the Super Bowl. <laughs> Do you feel that the new generation of black comedians are working to too exclusive an audience? Absolutely. And you have the separation of clubs now. Let's say 25 years ago, that's the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that it's becoming that way again. Is there such a thing as African-American humor? What is it? I think there's African American humor because we've been laughing at white folks for a long time. <laughs> and we had to do it in a way that they wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that goes back.
back to when we were slaves in this country. They used to talk about stuff right in front of us like we weren't there, so. And then they'd be like, the niggas knew everything was gonna happen. How'd they know? <laughs> <laughs> they stand there, I'm the damn, I'm the house nigga. I'm in there, I'm listening to them playing the war. Then when I know, they, oh, how in the hell did they, I was standing there, you, you know, but anyway. African American humor, that's that new name, African American. Used to be colored and black and Negro. Yeah. I used to love it when it was uh, uh, just, just old colored man. <laughs> when I was growing up, it was a colored man. Now it's African American. <laughs> well, people get upset by all the different names. They want it to be right, you know. I guess. You know, quite as kept. I like Coon. You what? That wasn't a bad name. Coon. I used to call my mom. You little pretty old Coon. You. Did you? Yes, I did. She loved that. Hey, Andy Brown. It's about time, man. Jimmy, what's wrong with your grandmama, man? <laughs> Well, we talk about how, the, how um, you know, slavery and repression... Uh, was that comedy in slavery? Yeah, was that... Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, every, every social, uh, you know, every social thing that happens to black people is funny. Uh -huh. Back to L.A. riots, when they happened, you weren't here then. No, we, I we, was here. We watched it on TV. You watched it on TV, see, you get a different thing, a different feel, but when you're actually in the riots. I was right. there, in it. You were in it. it. I didn't steal it. I knew people Oh, stole come on. Oh, yeah. Come on. Well, I got a VCR yeah. and a blender. <laughs> And a box of shoestrings. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of useless stuff, but you know when you're stealing stuff, you don't have time to sort. Out. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, what we were doing is, um, like I said, whenever there's, whenever there's like, like something happens bad to black people, we, we we've been able to bring Why is that? Why is that? Because that's all we got is laughter. That's all we got. The man has managed to take everything else away from us but our ability to laugh. Mm -hmm. See, that's what you gotta talk about on your damn show. And if you don't have that on there, then you're missing the damn point. Mm -hmm. You're missing the whole damn point. What you do when you first start off, take your time, start from, from the top here, go around a circle, just take your time. It doesn't have to be exact perfect. Mix it all in, all on. And cracks. It'd be a great twilight zone. You put it on, you couldn't be able to take it off. <laughs> have to go to work the next day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then around here, and then around the, around the lips. Mm -hmm. And you take the white, mm -hmm. go slowly. With the white, you have to go slowly. Slowly. Yes. Uh, because they, that has, that's the careful part. That's the careful right, part. Right. Right. That's the, the most important part, the white lips. <laughs> yeah, just slap the black <laughs> on. Slap the black on. You don't have to be that. That's all right. Get the black over with. And then be real careful with the white be part. Be very, very delicate with the white. Right. Very delicate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, go inside the lips. Yeah, you gotta be very careful. We don't want the white and the black in the green. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Open the door, Richard. Richard. Yeah. Open the door no. and let me in. Yeah. I can't, I, it, it's no, been a long no time, you know, I could not. Lenny, I am very happy to welcome you at Chez Josephine in New York. Mm -hmm. For the past 18 years, I've been working on what I hope will be the definitive biography of my second mother, Josephine Baker. Next to me is Maud Russell, 96 years old. It's my pleasure. Known in her heydays as a slim princess. Then we have a wonderful gentleman who is only 81 years old young and still kicking like when he was 11 years old at Club Alabama in New York, mm -hmm. Louis Carpenter. Mm -hmm. Nice and new, yeah. And next to us, the young chicken of the group. <laughs> She's a few years younger than everyone. And her name is Cleo Hayes. And I am very happy that she is with us because she's one of the few ladies who perform in blackface. In those days, to be funny, you had to perform in blackface. It so was nothing wrong with it. Didn't, didn't people, how did black people feel about blackface? I mean, weren't they, didn't they think this is strange? No. No, it was accepted. It was well, comedy, it that's was, the way uh, it was, uh, yeah. and they loved it, and we enjoyed it. And every week that theater was jam-packed, mm. and what they loved the most were the bits after the yeah. dancing girls.
years ago, you all were speaking about minstrel that's, shows. That's where the original. There were always a group of men sitting on the stage. There were always at least two to four men on each end of that minstrel, blackface. They were white and blackface. That's mm -hmm. where it came from. Mm -hmm. Then it became Remember colored that. men using blackface. Mm -hmm. But what did you feel? Nothing? No, Thank no, you. no, 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 it wasn't was nothing. Right. If it was anything, a colored person looking at a white person using cork, we'd say they're trying to imitate us. That's been history. They've always imitated us and taken from us. What the non-black world thought of, of blacks and when they thought of humor was someone who was stupid and ignorant. That was what was funny about being black. And to be black itself was to be funny. Um, minstrelsy then was created by showmen, uh, European immigrants from the north, who basically, because they wanted to create a stage image of someone that could be laughed at very easily, simply put on blackface and said, okay, <laughs> the the most, uh, the funniest thing in America at this point are black people, because blacks are naturally funny. It's great. Uh -huh. It's easy for you. One line, huh? One line. One line. That's me. It's pretty good. Mm. The blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. I can't really tell you have our makeup, to be honest. For me? Uh -huh. Oh, but I'm darker than you, so, you know. You're darker than me? Yeah. That could be a movie. Darker than me. Mm -hmm. Darker than me. I have this uh, sheet music, which is the most extraordinary song called Coon, Coon, Coon. Uh, and which the lyrics are something like, although it's not my color, I'm feeling mighty blue. I've, I've got a lot of trouble. I'll tell it all with you. I'm certainly clean disgusted with life, and that's a fact, because my hair is woolly and because my color is black. And it goes on to say, my girl, she took a notion against the colored race. She said that if she would wed me, I'd have to change my face. She said that if she'd wed me, that i regret it soon. Yes, I'm not, now I'm sure good at heart because I'm a coon. And it goes, coon, 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 I wish my skin would fade. Coon, 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 I'd like a darker shade. Coon, 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 morning, night, and noon, I wish I was a white man instead of coon, coon, coon. Then he goes on and sings the second verse, and he says, which I think is very fascinating just in terms of the dynamic in this country of people molding their faces and dyeing their skin and changing their hair. He says, I had my skin enameled, I had my hair made straight, I dressed up like a white man and certainly did look great. Then he goes out talking about how he went off to see his sweetie, he went walking through the park and he saw two dove birds making love in the dark and they stopped and looked me over. I knew my finish soon when both those birds said good and loud, coo 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 coo. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean, Arabic features? That your nose isn't flat? Yeah, that's what it means. Oh, is that what it means? Yeah. I think flat noses are hip, especially if you live in the mountains. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that you need air to higher your <laughs> To cold. get more. Yes. To yeah. get more. I'm proud of, look, I'm, I'm proud, proud of my nose. Yeah, you should be. Yeah, my nose. I've got a good, strong, no. big nose. No, you have Michael Jackson's old nose. I recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Michael would kill for this nose now. Huh? Michael's nose is falling apart. He now. doesn't have a nose now. You can see the perforations in it. Oh, it's very scary. God won't recognize him when he goes to heaven. <laughs> you know, in the old days, doing slavery, they had, at the end of cotton, when they finished picking cotton, mm -hmm. they would have uh, a party, and the master would give a cake to the prettiest couple. Uh -huh. So do you think of the prettiest couple? was the people who looked most like him, the light-skinned blacks. He'd give the cake to. So the black, black, blue blacks, uh -huh. they would do a dance called the cakewalk, to get, you heard the cakewalk? Uh -huh. To get the master's attention. That's why you hear a lot of blacks in America say, if that don't that take the cake, the cake yeah. if that don't take the cake. So some people are still trying to take the cake, uh -huh. and it's too bad. This guy was, had this musical he was doing, and it was, it was, it was all, in, all in minstrel show, and, and he wanted me to write the book for it or direct it or do something. And he was sitting there playing these songs. He was going, and then it happens like this, and then he break into the song, and then he starts to do this, and then he starts to do that. <laughs> and it was the most, and at and, and one point my, 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 my Negro hostile brain immediately clicked in and said, George, be offended. And then it said, my brain said, no, look. And then when I looked, I saw that what was going on was this phenomenal level of envy. And he wanted to escape into a culture, and, he, and that was his only way he knew how to get inside of it, because he could not surrender his arrogance. But at the same time, he was consumed by his envy. 
so that therefore he mocked the thing and then he became it because he desperately wanted to become it. And that's when I view this whole you know, context in a whole other way. Mr. Bones? Mr. Bones? Boy, does you need a hearing aid? Mr. Bones? Africa was an oral culture when the slaves were brought over here. And uh, wordplay, verbal acuity, the, uh, the, the ability to, to, to speak clearly and cleverly was uh, a very prized trait. And so the African slaves that came over here had that. And uh, thinking of, of one um, example of typical slave humor of the time that you find in folklore is a story about a master who comes to a slave and says, uh, 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 John, how do I look? And the slave says, uh, Master, uh, you look mighty. And the uh, master says, well, John, uh, you don't know what, what mighty means. What, what, what is that? And he said, well, master, you look noble. And he said, well, noble, uh, John, what's that mean to you? And he said, well, you look like a lion, master. And the master says, uh, John, you never saw a lion. And the slave says, well, I did, master. I saw a lion down in the field the other day. And the master says, uh, oh, John, you silly boy. That wasn't a lion. That was a jackass. And the slave says, well, master, that's exactly what you looks like. <laughs> Was your pappy a soldier? Yes, sir. He was at the Battle of Bull Run. He was one of the ones that ran. He had a horse pistol, my father did. You mean a hospital? No, a horse pistol. He raised it from a colt. Did he ever do anything brave? Yes, at one time he saved a whole regiment from being killed. How come? He killed the cook. No, that won't work. Why not? You have to do it with more Negro dialect. Old fashioned. Old, old fashioned? Yeah, come on. Was your pappy a soldier? Yes, sir. He was at the Battle of Bull Run. He was one of the ones that ran. He had a horse pistol, my pappy did. You mean a hospital? No, a horse pistol. He raised it from a colt. <laughs> <laughs> did he ever do anything brave? Yeah. At uh, one time, he saved the whole regiment from being killed. How come? He killed the cook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Bones, oh. you're the funniest man alive. Oh. <laughs> See, that's better, see? Yeah, now you'll get paid. When blacks really got on stage themselves, they were sort of forced to do the same thing. They became black minstrels and put on blackface themselves and used, well, corked up themselves. Um, initially, they, they didn't do any black humor either. What they did was to um, imitate the whites who had been in minstrelsy before them. But tonight we're going on and we're going to do it different. We'll do this. Yes. And then we'll just say in a regular voice. Yes. Kiss, Kiss my black ass. And then we'll do it minstrel so they'll, the white audience will get it. Kiss, Kiss my, my black, black ass, ass. y'all. <laughs> this is really weird for me, you know. This is so strange. I didn't know if I was going to tell you this, but I, I, uh, when I was 16, I was just starting. Um, the guy who was looking after me didn't really know what to do with me so he went to this entrepreneur and said you know I want Lenny to get some experience in the business I don't quite know what to do and this entrepreneur ran had two shows going he had a, a summer show up north and he had a club tour of the black and white minstrels and uh, you mean white people doing black yes I mean it was, a it was a huge show in England I mean it uh, it ran for 21 years at the Victoria Palace it was a top rated television show it was it was the the thing and um, this entrepreneur suggested that I should be in the Black and White Minstrel Show because it would give me the best experience. So, because I was being, I had, a, I had to, I signed a contract, you know, and I was very young. But I did it. I did the Minstrel Club tour, and then the next year I did uh, 22 weeks in one place, and I did it for five years. I was the second spot comedian in the Black and White Minstrel Show. I would go on, do my jokes, and then the minstrels would come on and sing the Camp Town Races, sing this song, do da, do da. They would do that. I don't regret it because I was getting experience, but this it was brought a, it all back. Yeah, but it, this, yeah. of course, it brought it all back because I used to sit in the performers' makeup room and I'd watch them putting the makeup on. It's so strange. I didn't know to tell you or not. You know, I thought you might be offended or something. You know, I, you, I think that you had to experience this to get from there to here. Mm. You wouldn't be who you were without that experience. Mm. It's all a part of developing and creating. And you were 16 years old. Mm. I mean, I'm just saying that because it's coming from inside from my heart. 
What, you, how you thought I was going to react to it? <laughs> Kick my ass. You tar baby, you <laughs> coon, you house nigger, you happy slave. No, <laughs> is that what you thought I was going to say? <laughs> you stop me. You sell out, you double agent. No, you had to experience that. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's a part of life. That was part of the system. But uh, it's like today, I don't know. Or, or, you know how I feel about it, I mean, as a comedian. I mean, uh -huh. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. You have to keep a sense of humor. Hey, Smith was prejudiced. Period. And what did she used to do? Big she sang. Singer. In Kate blackface? Too. No, no, no. She no, sang. No, no. She didn't want to be in the show with <laughs> colored folks. They had a party for the people in Honeymoon Lane, and the stage was set up for a party. She made a remark that, uh, you know, she didn't want to be at a party with... <laughs> with niggas. That's what she said. Well, so what? Why are you afraid to say that word? I, I, yeah, I tell you, I'm not afraid to say it, but if I keep using it, I'll never get rid of it. So consequently, I don't use it. And I don't encourage nobody to use it. You know how the term honky came about? You mean, you know, let me tell you, my great grandmother is white men, it's illegal for a white man and a white black woman to marry. Illegal. It can't happen. Mm -hmm. So, in the wee hours of the night, white men would come into the black neighborhoods and turn off their car lights and just honk their horns and the black woman would come out. And so they would call them honkies. Derogatory. You know what a honky term, is, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's a white a, person, isn't it? You know where that term came from? No. no. Okay. It originated when the brothers was on the plantation and the way white people talk. Well, you know, Bill, move that bell and put it over there. That honk sound they make in their voice. <laughs> honky. Honky! You understand now? You got that? Is it how they That's how it invented. Hey, honky! Earth. Shine was a hero, supposedly the only black person on the Titanic. And the, the alternate title that uh, of, is, is the singing of the Titanic. And what happens in the story is that um, Shine, um, ultimately when he finds out that the, the, the ship is sinking, uh, jumps off the ship and decides to swim home. And all the time, all the way, as he's swimming away from the ship, he's talking to the people on the ship who are treating him to help them get, get off themselves. And basically, he's telling them to, uh, <laughs> I think maybe I should skip this part. No, go ahead. <laughs> he's telling them to go f <laughs> 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 So th that was a whole uh, genre of folk tales that came out. And these, uh, those tales never, never became public. That was strictly something that existed within the black community and was never even mentioned to whites. Okay, signifying would be, Looking at somebody like yourself, yeah. looking you up and down, and attacking, uh, attacking you, verbally attacking, attacking. You. your wardrobe, your look, your haircut, your sideburns, which is something I ain't seen on the brother. Not to mention your funny <laughs> accent. Oh, not to mention the accent. You talk rather funny. I talk funny. Funny. Yeah. You talk funny. Yeah. Well, it give me like, something. It sounds like your your how do you say? It? You have something stuck in your ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> but, um, you know, and it's your head. Oh, I heard okay, there you go. Well, I heard is it. that signifying? It's signifying. Oh, good, good, good. You, got, you just you came back on somebody who I thought couldn't be came back on. Exactly. And see, white folks always looking for to, to covet our being. Right. You know, they're the biggest coveters. And co we talk about Japan copying. White folks copy most than Japan can ever copy. Right. They don't have. You know, white people just naturally boring to begin with. Yeah. They Let's be honest. Yeah. That's why they was lynching niggas in the, on Sundays. They didn't have shit else to do. I think one of the first racial riots was in the end of the 1930s in Harlem and blacks were becoming um, tired, I guess, of simply going along or being passive about the, the racial situation. The humor reflected that. You started to get comedians who were starting to tell, to deal with humor that had been active in the black community since slavery but had never been exposed to non-blacks. You've got people like Moms Mabley, who was as, as early as the 1930s, was doing humor that really had some bite to it. 
Uh, I mean, moms would tell, I guess one of her famous jokes was uh, the one about um, being stopped by a policeman in Georgia. She runs a red light and a cop comes over and says, Miss, why did you run that red light? And she says, well, I saw all the white folks went when the light was green. I thought it was our turn to go when it was red. <laughs> so, 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 and as the times changed, they were able to put in more and more. <laughs> but you know, those two words, black power, really frightened a lot of folks. About a month ago, I got on a bus, and the bus was crowded, no seats available, and I wanted to sit down. So I paid my fare, and I turned around and yelled, Black Power! <laughs> <laughs> Two old women, 70 years old, got up and gave me their seats. <laughs> and they were colored. <laughs> I tell you, the, the, probably the worst thing happened to me, to really show you about the problems we have. In the height of the ride in Chicago, everybody was nervous and upset. So I got off from work one night and was walking down the street and this white cat's walking next to me on the sidewalk and he see me coming and he jumps off the sidewalk. And he says, uh, uh, buddy, you're not gonna hurt me, are you? You're not, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna bother me. And I says, well, no, I'm Dick Gregory, I'm nonviolent." He said, you mean uh, you don't carry no gun or no knife? I said, no. He said, you mean you don't do no cutting or shooting? I said, no. He said, you mean you really nonviolent?" I said, that's right. Man, he knocked the hell out of me. <laughs> I think Gregory was really the, the, the person who changed all of it. Beginning in the 60s, Gregory um, escalated the humor to a cerebral stage, where an intellectual stage, where it was difficult for people to react to it, except by thinking about it. And Gregory was very good at what he did. And I had a job working in a steel mill, making 105 millimeter houses. And I would lift 243 pieces every 20 minutes. It weighed 45 pounds a piece. And the first day on the job, man, for the lunch break, I just sit and spit up blood. And my first weekend off taught me a lesson. I said to this friend of mine, I said, man, I am enjoying Saturday too much. Now, all my life, there's been a Saturday every week. I'm enjoying Saturday too much for working to be right. So I must be doing something wrong on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So I ain't never going back to work no more. So I decided I wasn't going back to work. So then I got to go pick up my pay. And that's something I never understood, you know. Uh, the guy says, you, you fired. And, and so consequently, what happened was that I went to get my money and a black friend of mine drove me out and I'm talking bad, man. Yeah, hey, man, I didn't want this old honky job anyway, man. The niggas, they got to be crazy. And I went in and white guy scared me and said, nigga, where you been? And I mean, it scared me. I said, my mama died. Now I was talking bold in the car. And the <laughs> white guy came over and hugged me and said, oh, son, oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, can I help you? Can, you? can you do anything? You need any money? I said, well, I'm coming to pick up my pay. And he said, no, I don't mean that. And he pulled out his hand and gave me $10. And I worked the rest of the day, man. And my friend out in the parking lot waiting on me. And he don't know I'm in there so scared. This white man then yelled at me. And I lied to him. So then everything's cool. I'm back at work. Got my check. And then one day the weather got good. You know, when you're in, young in high school, man, the weather's good and the ladies look nice. So I'm just standing on the corner rapping. I remember that. I, so it's come time to go to work. I'm not going to work. So now I got to pump myself up. I, said, man, I ain't think about them crackers. Man, I ain't going to work. And I teach, taught myself I wasn't going to work. And so about two days later, I said, I quit. And then I go back out on payday to get my check. And the white guy said, nigga, where you been? I said, my mama died. And he hugged me again. And that's when I realized we were going to have some problems. When you tell the same white man, your mama died twice within three months. <laughs> That's the first time I started understanding we had a problem. He <laughs> hugged me, did the same thing. I literally, tear came in his eyes. So, oh, son, I'm, boy, I'm sorry to hear that you need anything. I said, I come to pick up my pay. He gave me another $10. I, I worked all day. <laughs> and this was like a one load, one shot, load up again thing. And it must have been funny to watch something like the Revolutionary War where one man is shooting against another and it must have looked exactly like this. At that point, this was about 1968, Cosby was the American comedian. Cosby was the sort of raceless comedian. And even that was, was revolutionary in a sense because Cosby didn't really do traditional black or African-American humor. The revolutionary thing about Cosby was for a black 
comedian to step on stage and really, in a very subtle way, say that race means nothing was in fact revolutionary. Could you tell the people who you are, please? Yes, my name is Dr. David Allen Greer, noted uh, PhD and sociologist. He ain't no doubt. Ah, uh, kidding ya! I think if Bill Cosby tried to do his act at the Apollo as an unknown comic, he would not last 30 seconds. Why? They would hit him in the head with a brick. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. But what I'm trying to say is, in out of that, his genius. <laughs> No, I, I like Bill Cosby, but I, I think that he just needs to lighten up. You know what I mean? I mean, he felt, you know, every second of TV, African-American TV should be, you know, to uplift the race, to reach out and teach kids. And I, I think that maybe the way you do that is not in front of a blackboard with a piece of chalk. You know, you can, you can uh, be enlightened and all that without being preachy. But basically, I grew up in a Cosby world, you know, in the, in the world of his show. I was in a cab in New York and this guy goes, I don't like this white cab driver. said, he didn't think the Cosby show was good because it just, it, it posed unreasonable expectations on the African American community. And I said, but that's the kind of world I grew up in, mm. you know? And he was like, yeah, right, sure. And I'm Donald Duck, <laughs> you know? <laughs> people don't want to believe it. White people out. have an, a, an aversion to the truth. They have an aversion to they don't like it at all. And Dick Gregory was saying, here it is. But the most brilliant person to have brought it out, what I have to say was prior, when he came to knowledge mm -hmm. and, and thought to himself, I don't think I'm playing this game right. I want to tell him about this stuff. Mm -hmm. See, he's, prior was brilliant because he showed white people how we see them. Because we already know how you see us. Right. But we see you, and this is what you do, and not only this, let me show you what goes on in my neighborhood, because you sure don't know, because you got you this, never come you, know, down you, you won't never come down right. here. So since you put us here, let me show you what goes on in our neighborhood. Let's hear you birds sing that. Tweet, tweet my ass. You got to get down. See, people got to understand this community. Sir, fool, you better slow that car down. Goddamn, you don't come drive down through here like you crazy. This a neighborhood, man. This ain't no residential district. <laughs> See that boy over in the streets? See that boy? Used to be a genius. Boy used to book the numbers, didn't need paper or pencil. <laughs> Not a nigga can't remember his shoelace. <laughs> Get off the street, boy! What's happening? Look at that nigga. <laughs> Move, mother... Before you get run over, boy, get out the way! Oh, uh, say, man, I feel bad enough to drink some milk. You got anything? Yeah, boy, I got some. I got some advice for your ass. You better lay off that narcotic nigga that made you null and void. <laughs> That's right, you better try to go to work, get a job, be somebody respectable. Brown out here in the streets like a fool, you could help the community. I think that what people thought of as being normal before the 1960s, after, by 1970, was no longer thought of as normal. More radical things were acceptable. I mean, we had had uh, Malcolm X was dead, the two Kennedys were dead, there had been riots in major cities all across the country. Uh, the vision of America as a very settled, stable, society was no longer there. White friends, black people do not all look alike. <laughs> it is you that all look alike. <laughs> I'm gonna prove it. I make a statement, I'll prove it for you. Now, white friends, look all around the room. All the whites look at each other. <laughs> See there, all of y'all are just white. Now look at us, all different colors, black walnut, 
Burn almond. Chocolate. Chocolate mocha. Pecan. Vanilla. Yellow, mellow, light, bright, and damn near white. Well, let me tell you. See, I want to get married, but Killer, my boyfriend, that's my boyfriend, Killer, he says he wants to keep the relationship as is. Oh, I see. See, Killer says if I want to get married, I must be crazy. So I want another opinion. <laughs> so you want me to help you solve your problem, is that correct, Michelle? If you expect to get paid. <laughs> Trust me, Geraldine. If you don't, I can't treat you. <laughs> just, just lie on the couch. Is it any cheaper if I stand up? No. No, you just lie on the couch. And don't shove. Don't shove. <laughs> don't push me. Don't you ever push me. <laughs> you want me to sit down and just say, Geraldine, have a seat. Don't push me. Don't you right. ever, 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 if you ever run into me anywhere, Tell anybody you with, don't push up. An interesting comparison is Flip Wilson had all of the gestures. He had everything except the satire. So in a way, Richard Pryor was the epitome of black or African-American humor because he had the gestures, he had the, the language, the body language, he had the, the facial expression, he had the tone of voice, he could move from character to character, and he also had the satire. I first came down, you know, in 19... No, no. No, no. Oh, no. You're thinking about the one where... Um, well, I first just... met God, God in 1929 outside of a little hotel in Baltimore. You see, I was walking down the street. Uh, I don't believe you heard me. I said I was walking down the street. <laughs> I was not running. I was walking. Yeah. <laughs> Eat the tuna fish sandwich. No, it's sandwich. 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 And that's when I heard the voice of God. No, 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 no. no. And, and I heard the voice. I heard his voice call unto me from down the dark, dark alleyway. And I, I knew it was the voice of God. Because it had power and majesty. And, and the voice said, Give me, me some. Um, give me no, some of that yeah. sandwich. Give me some of that sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my friends, my friends, I did not, I did not venture down that dark alleyway because it might not have been the voice of God. But two or three niggas with a baseball bat, and God only knows, and he wasn't talking, and I wasn't walking. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. Right now, I think every comedians are disconnecting and going with just, you know, the shell of what is comedy to me. You know what I mean? I mean, I think that when I talk to them off stage, they have these wonderful, incredible minds. But then they go on stage, and then they do just a piece of them. Mm -hmm. And that piece is brilliant. There's, there's some funny, 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 funny people. But if that other side came out, it would just be incredible. If you want to know sex lives and, you know... And I had it on the back side, you know. <laughs> and I told her, girl, you got to let go. <laughs> and I mean, that's what, that's what you'll see a lot of, Lenny, here in this country. Mm. So, uh, so, so I think that if everybody's cursing on stage, then that's easy. Mm. If there was nobody cursing at the time when Richard came out, nobody else dared to say those words on stage. Lenny, you know, uh, Bruce went to jail. You know, and now when you think about comedians coming and going, F, F, suck my woo, and you know she can poo, you know, and so it's like Lenny Bruce must be going, I went to jail for this. <laughs> I went to jail for this. Now check this out. You got white boys that hate black people, but they black women. Brothers can't stand white folks stroking white girls. So crazy you could have people come from Mars. Everybody could hate them. But I bet you my last bean pie, somebody's going to f them green bitches. <laughs> There's been a, a critique of uh, the new style of mm -hmm. new Def Jam comedians. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about that? Well, you know, see, I have a lot of problems with that because, you know, a style of Def Jam, Def Comedy Jam comedians, I know a lot of those guys, mm -hmm. and each one of those performers are unique and different. But, you know, a lot has been said. Some people say, you know, well, it's, you know, a throwback to 
you know, it's a 1990s version of a minstrel show and that kind of stuff, which is, to me, is just garbage, you know. If you take a crowd who's used to somebody, you know, yelling in the air, I need a gangster bitch! You can't just come <laughs> out, hi, I'm a Negro, I live in the suburbs, no. I'll never forgive her to the day I die. And that's the truth. <laughs> Just blew my book. I'm about to look a fire. Oh, honey, this is she for trades on the friend she never had for. It's the truth. She said that. Oh, police. When you were doing in Living Color, did anybody ever say that, oh, these are just negative images? I mean. Well, when you're, when you're black, doesn't matter what you do you will be criticized and somehow some way someone will try to take what you're doing and make it negative you take the Cosby show you couldn't find a more perfect family so they criticize Cosby for not being realistic <laughs> you know what I mean then on the other hand if you created a show about a uh, uh, lower income family, they criticize you for being stereotypical. I've never heard any white show referred to as stereotypical. Those words never come into play. Those criticisms never come into play. Those politics never come into play. That to me is the most offensive thing. I can't just be a comedian. I gotta change the world. You know what I mean? I can't just go up and tell jokes and get laughs and go. And that, that's the way America is for blacks. It's like you can never do enough. You know what I mean? Forget that, you know, you got out of the, the, the projects, you didn't go to jail, you didn't wind up on drugs, you did do, you accomplished something, but you didn't solve racism. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, man, you struck yeah, out. Right. So, you know, it's like at what point do you celebrate, is what I say. So I don't even pay them no mind. You know, I never thought of that. I never thought of it. Sir, he tried to pay my debt, sir. If you treat me right, I will treat you right. <laughs> yeah. She is a phony, honey. She, she said that. Yeah. Oh, well, she's a fool. A fool. Yeah. You know, maybe she, No, no, no. Maybe she suffers from depression. Oh, girl, you shouldn't have said that to her. I'm not she's gonna bring me. Oh. Well, I hope you're all right. Oh. Keenan, when, when we started doing our show um, in Living Color, he said, well, I don't really want to do a political show. I just want to make people laugh. But you see, because of the fact that we are a predominantly African-American performers, it was coming from our perspective, and we were talking about our world in which we lived, it became inherently political. Of course. And right now, it's much easier, especially for black comics, to go up, you know, and say, hey, what's up, you know? <laughs> a moment of silence for Malcolm X. The black sisters look good in the house tonight. <laughs> all right. It's hard being a black man, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Saw a white man today. I shot him. All right now, you know. <laughs> when I walk the streets, niggas run, duck, and hide their hoes. Mom, they give a <laughs> so I really give a damn. And if you want to scrap, <laughs> mother <laughs> here I am. <laughs> That's enough, man. <laughs> oh, wow. That's enough. Whoa. Whoa. I'm going to do a CD album. That nigga is hard. nigga can hey, take hey. a second hey. win. I was just out there, man, you know just trying to make it, you know what I mean? Whatever I could do to, to get some money, that's what I was doing, you know what I mean? Whatever, if it was robbing, selling crack cocaine, whatever. It didn't really matter to me because all I cared about was what was on TV or what the next man had. I was trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know what I mean? And I didn't want to be broke, you know what I'm saying? I, nobody, who, who, who in life wants to say, yeah, I want to, I'd rather live in the ghetto. You know what? Living in the ghetto is cool. Getting food stamps, that's cool. Section 8, that's wake great. Up, waking up hungry. <laughs> Kids nowadays don't get whooped like we used to get, huh? Man, we used to get our ass whooped. Man, now, cause nowadays it's like child abuse. Man, remember your mother whooped you with, and your mother whooped you with anything. My mother whooped me with a phone one time. Bing, answer the phone. Hello? I think it's for you. 
I didn't even want to do comedy. I used to go to comedy stores and heckle, and heckle people and heckle shit. the comedians. This motherfucker you know used to be in the audience just <laughs> heckling his ass off. So <laughs> finally, I didn't feel nobody was funny. And yeah. I used to just talk, and he used to tell me, he said, man, you need to stop doing that back there and get on stage. Mm -hmm. And I used to, I would, just like he asked me, I used to ask him, how do I start doing comedy? He brought me over his house, and he kept telling me to do my homework. And I know what he was talking about. You didn't know what he was talking I, about? He just kept telling me to do my homework. And then he gave me this, I don't want to bring this up because I know he's going to ask for it. He gave me this. <laughs> This uh, Red Fox book, uh -huh. and told me to read it, and he gave me uh, like two tapes of Richard Pryor, and told me to listen to him, and I did it, and I kept the tapes in the book, and I. Never <laughs> <laughs> Yo, those yeah, those those was like the books that you know was given to me, mm -hmm. and you know some of the pointers that was told to me to do, you know what I mean? So. But was it like mean, a Red Fox how to how to do comedy book? No, no, it was it was it was actually just like a Red Fox guide to the black humor. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It it, it, it chronicles like humor from like way back in the slavery days on up minstrel on up wow. so it gave a look on all the comedians of the past because if you don't know your past you don't know your future yeah. mm -hmm. so you in the comedy business you got to know who was the great ones what, what made them great you know what i'm saying then you got to know what's happening now and then you got to look toward your future so what you do is you build it so that's what i gave to him you know what i'm saying You know, white people are amazing. They create their own little worlds, like the world according to Garb, Wayne's world, cool world. Well, I say I live in white racist world. That's where I live, and I want you to see my world. And I want you, I tell white people all the time, you could not be black for a week. Hell no. Because you kill yourself. You kill yourself over some black You couldn't deal You kill yourself. You kill yourself. You kill yourself. White, people could, white people could not be black for a day and start at noon. They just couldn't handle it because they're too light nags. Now see, this is better. Now you can do yeah. regular comedy on a regular pace. Yeah, yeah. That's you. Do little menstrual stuff. Yeah. Good evening, white people. See, that's a better show. See how things have changed. That's a, yeah, hmm? things have changed. Let's go. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go.